the people he interviewed, uh, photocopies of newspaper clippings from local newspapers, which are not digitized. <laughs> I know it's a little controversial to keep photocopies of newspaper clippings, but um, uh, he also uh, found a diary from a worker from 1920 and he requested redacted FBI files. Those were mostly later than what we'll be talking about today, but it's interesting that the FBI starts to monitor unionizing in the 30s and 40s. And then most importantly, uh, there are cassette tapes of about 50 interviews with brass history workers from 1980 to 1981. Um, this presentation is largely me talking about how the strikers were fighting for their rights against the man, <laughs> but um, I also want to make sure that I'm thinking about like bigger questions that impact my own practice as an archivist and how I can um, uh, use this as a way to, to think about and talk about my own practice and, and my own future practice. I love questions. So um, how can archives collect protest and strike materials ethically? How do oral histories complicate, expand, and reinforce official statements and newspaper clippings about the strikes? Interestingly, my original proposal for this talk had a much larger claim that oral histories always complicated this idea of um, anti-immigrant sentiments, but I found in my research that that's not actually true. For my one specific case, people brought their own biases to remembering the strike. So there were seven people total that were interviewed out of 50 that remembered the strikes in 1920. And uh, two out of seven of those characterized the strikers as troublesome, or they kind of uh, mimicked rhetoric about the strikers being Russians, aka like communists, aka not American. So this complicated my own understanding of oral histories as tools, as I had kind of wrongly assumed that those who had lived through the strike would be able to look back on it with this kind of like nuance understanding of what had happened and what had actually been gained. Um, but of course, our own memories are impacted by our biases. So um, I guess that shouldn't be really be a surprise. I'm also interested in how small archives um, like the Mattatuck can utilize oral histories to fill in gaps of knowledge, but uh, while also taking into account storage, obsolescence and access issues. Uh, lastly, how can archivists identify collections that uphold white supremacy and how can we challenge these instances of uh, white supremacy. So uh, first we need to talk about Waterbury, aka the Brass City. What was it like uh, around 1920 in Waterbury? What was it like to work in the brass factories? <clears throat> because it was relatively easy to obtain a good job in Waterbury, there were three large factories and many small factories in the area. People tended to move to Waterbury in search of a better life. Oral histories in the archive at the Mattatuck Museum show that a popular way of immigrating or migrating to Waterbury was based on familial connections. For example, Bertha Silver, she immigrated to Waterbury from the South following some of her family members who also helped her secure a job. In 1920, the stereotypical hetero family union, the father would work 10 to 12 hours a day, five to six days a week. The mother usually did not work although uh, some did work in factories or they took on piecework or extra sewing or cleaning. Um, and piecework was kind of like extra work out of the factory that you would get a, like a bundle rate for. Uh, working in the factories was dark and dirty and at times dangerous. In the early 1900s, brass factories were broken up into like various shops and buildings and each shop had a foreman and um, there would be like a casting shop, a rolling shop, and <laughs> this is kind of where my industrial knowledge uh, wanes. I'm uh, new to this position and new to industry history, so you'll have to bear with me. <laughs> I'm still learning. Um, within the shops, there are like various stations, and you can see in the photographs here, there's uh, usually like one skilled worker who uh, has the know-how and the ability to be able to, like, for example, cast a specific thing. And then there would be like one to two assistants to help with lifting, loading, pushing, etc. And sometimes stations would interact. So your station might push something through something and someone would take it at another station down the line. Um, but you would essentially be repeating the same action all day. In the 1800s, the skilled workers were really in charge. 
They protected their knowledge of their craft because uh, the management didn't really understand the techniques of each skilled worker and they couldn't really implement too many rules. However, um, in the 1900s, power started shifting to the management with streamlined training and shared knowledge. Foremen, overseers of each shop were a major cause of the strikes. Workers couldn't complain to higher ups directly and foremen often played favorites and contributed to dangerous working environments to increase productivity. Uh, foremen and administrators were obviously trying to get the most out of their workers. How can we make our workers more efficient? Can the job be done with less men, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can see in the image on the right, it's uh, very dark, which is, uh, and dirty, which is a uh, common, common life for them, unfortunately. Uh, working in a factory was very dangerous. This is a diagram of injuries sustained by factory workers in the fiscal year 1915 to 1916. Interestingly, this was published in the Scoville Bulletin to all employees. Uh, so uh, you can see there are over 11,000 injuries reported. Almost 8,000 of those are attributed to injuring thumbs or fingers. And to put this into context, around this time period, there were about 9,500 workers total. So uh, very uh, dangerous to work in these types of positions. One of the worst parts about listening to oral histories is <laughs> definitely that uh, the workers like to talk about injuries they either sustained or witnessed. Russell Sobin talks at great lengths about uh, how he watched a man one day get most of the skin on his forearm uh, taken off of his forearm by getting sucked into a machine. And that man did not go back to work. Um, in 1920, there was also a somewhat common illness amongst certain of the factory workers called the brass shakes. It was later found to be caused from breathing in fumes when the brass was being heated, but the illness caused flu-like symptoms and the shakes. So safety precautions were kind of nominal. Most people wore gloves, but no kind of eye protection. There's, I think, uh, 877 uh, eye, eye injuries in, the, in between the year of 1915 and 1916. Um, there were some announcements and safety guides in the company bulletins about the proper way to lift things, but it kind of just boiled down to like, be smart, don't cut corners, pay attention to what you're doing, which not, not great. Um, so uh, what was it like living in Waterbury? This is an image of downtown Waterbury with trolleys and cars uh, kind of around uh, circa 1920. Uh, Waterbury was very ethnically divided in terms of race and ethnicity in the late 1800s through the early 1900s. Uh, Italians, Lithuanians, Russians, Polish, and Irish people immigrated to Waterbury. Included in the Russian population were Russian Jewish people who were escaping persecution in, uh, from Russia. There was also a growing uh, population of African Americans in Waterbury due to migration uh, from the South. And so this mix of various identities in Waterbury and in the factories led to certain instances of racism and prejudice. Of course, there are some wonderful stories in the oral histories of people of color saying that Waterbury was great and that they didn't experience any racism during this time period. But I think that this image of like a mixing pot of people is far too simplistic. Um, in the 1920 diary of Charles Walker, a journalist who spent some time working in the American brass industry, uh, he used various uh, racial slurs and pejorative terms for certain ethnicities in his descriptions of various factory workers. He was doing this kind of like Upton Sinclair-like undercover journalist getting the story, but he wasn't interested necessarily in the treatment or the conditions of the workers or the factories. He was interested in like the ingenuity of the development of the techniques. Um, so he included like uh, things in his diary about calling his assistant the N-word. And he talked about how he was going to talk to the Spaniards who look like monkeys at lunch. And so sure, you might say, Stephanie, listen, this is just one instance of one person having a, a, a bad experience and that's not, common, but at the same time, I would argue that the Scoville Foreman's Association, a group of all of the foremen would get together regularly for dinners and at their dinners, they would provide entertainment in the form of minstrel shows. And it's not one, it's many, many instances of minstrel shows. Um, so I think, you know, I'm not saying that everything was bad and awful all the time, but I think that there's a much more complex understanding and reality to how people were able to interact with each other in Waterbury during this time. Um, and then lastly, we need to talk about pay. 
Now, I haven't been able to find official pay rates, but from an oral history with Russ Sobin from our archive, I do know that Scoville used a hierarchical ranking to determine pay rates. It went from like A to H or I, and the lower ranks were the unskilled workers. Um, a was reserved for upper management. And so the unskilled workers around 1920 were taking home as little as $27 a week. And we'll talk more about pay later. So the strike of 1919 was really a precursor to the strike of 1920. In 1919, directly after World War I ended, production dramatically decreased in the factories. This led to massive layoffs and wages being cut because companies didn't have the work contracts from the government anymore. In addition to losing your job or your pay rate, companies were also giving uh, less hours to workers in a very sporadic fashion. A strike was organized in the June of 1919 by the IWW and lasted for six weeks. This was the first big strike in the brass industry since the 1800s, and uh, they made significant gains, actually. They won the largest pay increase in brass history, 35% increase. Of course, in October of 1919, wages were slashed back to what they were before the strike. So I feel like this was like a... a local labor, a uh, test for local labor, labor leaders and for the heads of industry. The factory administrators knew that there was unrest throughout the uh, country in terms of labor. Um, according to an internal memo from 1921, Scoville sent John Bergen, who was the head of their Scoville Auxiliary Police, to monitor a strike in the Midwest. Uh, he studied the tactics of cops and factory administrators who successfully squashed a strike. And one of his most successful tactics that he found was to have hype over the strikers. And so uh, Scoville bought a bunch of horses for their auxiliary cops to ride around on. And actually the police from Waterbury as well learned from the strikes. A pair of cops in 1919 got overwhelmed in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Waterbury and their guns didn't fire properly. Eventually uh, backup came, but the cops were uh, beat up in a very bad way, um, unfortunately. Afterwards, the police department surveyed their, their guns and found that some of their guns were as old as 1865. So they purchased all new guns in the same kind of guns. They had like a variety, like a mishmash. Um, and so it became much more common for them to carry pistols on them as well. So the strike of 1920, about 15,000 workers from around the Waterbury area went on strike with about 3,500 of those workers from Scoville. Uh, the strike lasted from mid-April to the end of July. Strikers wanted a livable wage, safety precautions, and representation through the union. So this is my favorite image from the Brass City Strikes, a striker with a card in his hat that reads, Bread or Revolution? Uh, so who are the main players? First, there's Scoville's GM, E.O. Goss. He's on the far right. He was the head of Scoville and directly impacted the way that the company responded to the strikers. Goss had the Scoville's Foreman's Association, meet regularly to address how they are going to deal with the strike. Mayor William Sandling largely stayed out of the strike, but he did try to mediate between the unions and the factories. Uh, it didn't go well. <laughs> Police Sergeant George Beach attempted to maintain control over Waterbury, but in the June of 1920, the violence increased dramatically, and he attempted to make it very difficult for strikers with copious arrests and the refusal to allow strikers to march or even meet peacefully. The Scoville Auxiliary Police were hired by Scoville, but they actually reported to the police sergeant, Sergeant Beach. Their uh, main duty was to patrol the plants. In 1915, there were 10 Scoville police, but in 1917, there were 47. Uh, now a little bit, at, it's a little unclear exactly how many unions there were in Waterbury at the time. I read that there were over 50 unions, including one specifically for women, but none of the unions had any kind of representation or pull in or authority in any of the factories. The two largest unions in Waterbury were NIWA, the New England Workers Association, um, that was started in 1919 with the strikes, and then the AFL had a local chapter here as well. Um, the AFL local branch was led largely by a man named Ira Ornburn uh, from New Haven, and Newa was led by a local man named Luigi Scalmana. But unfortunately, the unions didn't get along with each other, and the AFL went on strike first, and Newa waited to see if the AFL would dissolve and they could swoop in and get the, their members. 
Each union had a series of committees, often based on language. In 1919, strikers spoke 19 different languages. NIWA had a larger representative community called the Unfailing Committee that presented demands to heads of industry and helped organize the strikes. So uh, how was the strike archived? The Mattatuck Museum did not actively collect materials about the strike until 1980. We do have some records of Scoville Manufacturing Company, but those were largely gathered haphazardly or sporadically throughout the years. Again, Harvard's Baker's Library has the totality of the Scoville records, including meeting minutes of the Scoville's Foreman Association, newspaper clippings, and memos about the strikes. So quite a bit of this material is digitized and available online through the Baker Library. These records, to me, are kind of like accidental social justice archiving because Scoville created really good records about their ridiculous anti-immigrant white supremacist response to the strike, even though they may have been just trying to document how ridiculous they thought the strikers were. I think it can be used against them. <laughs> uh, and then in 1980, as we've talked about, public historian Jeremy Brecker partnered with the Mattatuck to find out what everyday life was like for uh, the workers. And so uh, seven people that Brecker interviewed remembered the strikes of 1920, and out of those seven, two really stand out. We'll be listening to longer clips later, but um, James Tizo was a striker that um, James Tizo was a striker and his brother was killed by police in June of 1920. John Hollingworth was a member of the CT State Guard and he was called to Waterbury to try and maintain the, the, the peace. So we'll be listening to longer clips of those here. But um, I think that I would like to have us listen to Sarah Capella speak about her brief memories of the strike. This is from a digitized oral history with several uh, women workers. Uh, and this is just a, a very quick, like three minute clip about her own memories, which I find fascinating. Waterbury, yeah. yeah, of course. Okay. And a policeman was, was shot mm -hmm. in the back. Yeah. What, uh, can you tell me what that was about? We've been, we've heard something about it and it's not very been few written people about. Remember yeah. it. Right. Tell me about what was going on. What, what was the reason? That wait, wait a minute. Let me mm -hmm. think. It was what? I don't remember. She was only seven years old. It was a strike. It what strike was it? What, what was that strike about that time? You should know. I don't, Sarah. Remember don't when remember. Father Scolia was put out of town because he butt in and they sent him to New York? I don't remember that at all. How did he butt in? I think it was Scoville that had a strike, wasn't it? Oh, there was a lot of people and the cop got shot. It was oh. a factory. Yeah. Yeah. And then an awful lot of other people got involved in it beyond just the factory. Do you uh, remember had, Yeah, let me I wanna ask this you remember. Do you remember that there were do you remember the National Guard being here? Yes, I do. Hey, I'm eighty two years old. I remember well, that's everything. why I'm asking you. Tell <laughs> me She's old, yeah, she's old. Tell yeah. me what it was like on the streets. What did you see when you they, when the guards came in, everybody behaved. The guards just stood there and everybody behaved. There was only once uh, for two or three days the, uh, that they were fighting terrible, but then everything was cut out. Who was fighting? Who was fighting who? The men the, in the streets. Who was for the, for, you know, for the strike, who wasn't, and they were fighting. So um, Each other or the company or? It was Scoville that was on strike, I'm pretty sure. But you're saying they were fighting. I'm saying were the men fighting each other? Were they trying to bring pe workers in and that's who they were fighting? Do you remember? Well, naturally, the ones that wanted to go to work and the ones that didn't want to go to work, they'd fight. Oh, yeah. So, What happened? You said this father was sent out of town? He was sent away. Father Scoville was sent away for six months. Well, what happened there? Because he, but in, he, he got out in the street. Be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be ashamed. To who? To the people. To the people. Oh, was, he wanted All them to the go people. To work. Yeah. No, he wanted go back them to, to work. behave. That's right. <laughs> and and uh, they sent him away. See, and I hadn't heard that. Six before. months. Mm -hmm. And then dead, they, he came back he's again. Dead. Oh, yeah, he's, he's dead. dead. Yeah. Who sent him away? The the law. The bishop. The bishop. I imagine. The bishop. You know, they got in touch. The law got in touch with the bishop, and they took him out of here. He was. They. job, not going out and howling at the people. That's surprising, because usually the ones that stuck up for the people were the ones that they got rid of. <laughs> the factory owners, they kept them around. No, they, he, he got it. 
They got rid of him for six months. Do you remember there being... ...in the street? There there was a lot of people. We we were afraid to go out. We lived on South Main Street. We were afraid to go out. Was your your family involved in it? No, no, no. What did, did you know the reason that they were striking? They wanted more money. Every other <laughs> it's always for money, yeah. What yeah. do you remember about that? Well, you know, she's not from Waterbury. You weren't here at She that came time. later. No, I oh, came, yeah, she came at- Okay, so um, I particularly just enjoy her kind of like uh, going back and forth and trying to remember things and, and just kind of her overall summary. She's, uh, she's very lovely. And she dominated that oral history. There are a few other women in that oral history who definitely uh, didn't get enough uh, screen time. <laughs> uh, so. Out of barrier, yes. of course. Okay. Out of barrier. Yeah. Yeah. So the next page, sorry about that. Um, so uh, in the February of 1920, brass workers went on strike in Ansonia, which is just south below Waterbury. This began talks in local unions about whether or not they should join in on the strikes. Ultimately, on April 15th, the members of AFL, mem- the <laughs> members walked out of school while causing uh, the strikes in Waterbury. And this is an image of a parade uh, in Ansonia by Niwa members. Uh, so what did the strikers want? Uh, several unions, committees, and representatives approached industry leaders with demands, but these were the first set of demands, and they're also pretty much the core set of demands that everyone asked for. Uh, Number one, the right to organize and bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing. So what they're saying here is that they want their jobs to be protected and that the current structure of foremen prevents them from airing grievances. Uh, Remember when factories would try to cut costs by cutting men's jobs or slash their hours, the original gig economy, I guess. And if a worker had an issue, they could only take it to their foreman and foremen had too much power in the structure of the factory personnel and foremen often abused their power with favoritism. Uh, Number two, they wanted 44 hours to constitute a work week, eight hours a day, five days a week, and four hours on Saturday. Overtime pay is one and a half times for anything over that. Uh, Men wanted to be able to spend time with their families and have time for pursuing hobbies and have time for pursuing education. They basically wanted a better work-life balance. Number three, they wanted proper protection of the health of the employees, um, and it should be provided by the employer. We talked about the copious amounts of injuries that workers sustained and had to watch others sustained in the factories. Uh, Workers wanted the factories to have to pay out larger benefits to workers and workers' families if accidents or death happened, uh, making them fiscally responsible for safety. If the factories were fiscally responsible for safety, then they would have to take it more seriously and install real precautions and measures. And uh, number four, there will be established a minimum rate of wages of 75 cents an hour. This was really an issue about unskilled labor and the classification of unskilled labor. Workers were really arguing that there is no such thing as unskilled labor. Labor is labor and everyone deserves to have a livable uh, wage. The hierarchical pay structure where unskilled workers accepted 45 cents an hour for work devalued their work. Um, so we're not going to go over this, like, I'm not going to read everything to you, sorry. It looks a little overwhelming, but there's a lot of, like, big events that happened. So let's just go over a quick few. So again, in February, walkers worked out in, in Sonia, specifically at the Seymour Manufacturing, and this triggered a lot of other smaller companies to do as well. April 15th, 500 school workers walked out at 9 a.m., and this was seen as a complete failure, and uh, Niwa left the AFL to flounder for about a week. But between the 15th and the 22nd, more workers joined. And finally on the 22nd, Niwa voted to uh, strike as well. And so there are about 7,000 workers if you believe the factory's estimates out, 10,000 if you believe the the union. So um, strikers were holding meetings, conducting parades, handing out literature and meeting with workers in their homes to try to convince them to strike. Uh, Police were not aggressive at first, although they did break up parades for not having a permit, and they started slowly arresting people. Uh, In April 26th is when demands are given to factory administrators, and Scoville convenes the first uh, board of um, 
Foreman's Association or the SFA, uh, they came up with strategies for dealing with the strikers. They worked on things like alleviating intimidation of the workers. They believed that most strikers were staying out of work due to intimidation of violence, like they were going to get beat up if they tried to cross the picket line. Um, they were getting volunteers to departments that were suffering from losses so that nothing had to shut down. They were organizing community gardens and buying food wholesale for employees. School will issue a notice to uh, local papers that their plant will stay open for its loyal and courageous employees. April 30th, representatives from the unions and factories and a mediator from the Chamber of Commerce named Clark uh, met to talk about negotiations, but Clark is clearly on the side of the factories and talks about how wages have actually increased more than inflation. And he says some kind of confusing things about production and demand and supply that I don't really know why uh, were fit in, but they were. Uh, in May, the police start amping up intimidation tactics. They raid meetings and force them to close. They arrest strikers and protesters and Sergeant Beach begins to refuse all permits for parades. And when the strikers just try to walk silently together on the sidewalk, there's still arrests and police presence. A big turning point in the strike was when the skilled machinists went out on strike. Up to this point, Scoville was saying things akin to these unskilled workers are just being troublesome. They don't want to talk to us. We'll listen to our workers. We like our workers. They're being unreasonable. So the skilled workers in the machinist union put together demands of their own, and they tried to give their demands for a better workplace and a better work-life balance to management, and no one responded to them. So the skilled workers went out on strike as well, and the total of workers out in the end of May was 15,000. So negotiations have completely stalled at this point in between May and June because factories were gambling on the fact that they could keep their doors open and just outlast the strikers. They didn't have to give them any kind of uh, uh, demands or they didn't have to make any kind of adjustments that they would either starve or just get fired. In order to keep people from starving, some unions used their emergency dues funds to give everyone a dollar a day and others chose to raise money or give food to struggling families or a combination of all. As May dragged into June, the nonviolent nature of the strikes began to be tested. Cops were shutting down meetings, marches and parades weren't allowed, strikers were arrested and quickly sent to jail. Um, on May 30th, a bomb exploded outside the house of John Goss, brother of the GM of Scoville, and he was also a high up administrator in Scoville. And the beginning of the end is really uh, June 21st, a large protest turned deadly. Uh, there was a peaceful march at first around Scoville to demonstrate how many strikers were out, but Scoville police and possibly other police met the strikers, harassed them, and then there was some sort of inter altercation that turned uh, violent. So two cops ended up getting shot and a 19-year-old protester ended up dying. Public opinion turned away from the strikers and they couldn't maintain momentum to stay out. Most workers who weren't fired in the purge were back to work in late July, and there was absolutely uh, no concessions made for striking. So how did the media react to strikers? Framing them as problematic, anti-American, immigrant troublemakers who are all just Bolshevists who wanted to destroy the American way of life. <laughs> Sounds very dramatic, but uh, that's actually kind of how they were uh, described. On April 13th, just before the strike hit, a uh, tradesman wrote in to the Waterbury Republican to say something along the lines of, and I quote, but I don't see why we people who have spent our time learning a trade should be classed with unskilled workers. He goes on to like further link unskilled workers with immigrants by stating that if they get their pay increase, they'll just make money and go home. And that, uh, it seems as if the foreigners were running the shops today. There was a time when manufacturers would prefer to hire one of their own sooner than give the American speaking man a job. Um, so basically this writer is kind of alluding to the fact that unskilled workers should make less than him because he learned a trade at school, something that's often talked about today in reference uh, to people. And uh, if we want to keep unskilled labor, we need to make sure that they can't ever get ahead is essentially what he's saying. This writer is signaling to white middle-class Americans that immigrants are threatening our jobs and our way of life. Uh, on May 2nd, the Waterbury Republican published the Chamber of Commerce L.P. Clark's analysis. So uh, let's break down just two of his points. Number four and number six. Strikers are not citizens of Waterbury. 
I think he meant that the strike leaders may have come from outside of Waterbury and that Ansonia influenced Waterbury. But um, I'm very uh, troubled by that statement in general because the vast majority of the strikers lived in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Waterbury. They were Waterburyans. Like, who is a citizen of Waterbury if they are not? I don't understand that part. Um, and then lastly, public opinion is not with the strikers. I think he means public opinion of the white middle class people who are uncomfortable with the strike. Oh, to continue my rage at the journalists, um, let's look up at this piece of journalism. So the reporter went to a home of a Lithuanian striker and he looked around his home and he asked the Lithuanian man questions and he evaluated what the Lithuanian man looked like. and. To me, this article just kind of signifies how much people want to simultaneously like blame poor people for being poor, but also like keep them in poverty all while denying that poverty is even all that bad. Apparently because the worker didn't have sunken in cheeks, they weren't starving or experiencing any kind of like food problems. Uh, therefore, they didn't need to get more money. Apparently because this man was dressed in his nice Sunday clothing, that meant that he was perfectly capable and was perfectly capable of like uh, having a living wage. Uh, this article ends by saying that these immigrant people interrupt people at meetings and are very rude and don't follow the rules. So it just, this article is very problematic because it just frames poor people as being greedy, ungrateful, and rude. A huge factor in this debate over the, over which we can see in the previous article is this debate over the wages of the cost of living. The left clipping is a tally of costs of living by strikers, including only the basic necessities of food, insurance, and rent at $29 a week. The right clipping is a factory management version, making it $20.50. Uh, if you include kids and a wife, you have to add half of that cost back onto it, so $42. This is rather insulting. Um, but for a, uh, that would be for a single man for everything, twenty fifty. But most men in factory jobs were making under forty dollars a week. Some unskilled workers as low as twenty seven dollars a week, putting them into then a great debt. What reporters in the management school will like to claim is that wages increased more than the cost of living in the last two years, so people shouldn't be complaining, which is great. But you're then assuming that your wages were livable to begin with. And they weren't because even if someone does get a factory job and their wife has a job, their hours can get cut and their pay can get cut without any whim, which is what the strikers were also striking about, not just a wage increase. Um, as someone who grew up in a, pay in a paycheck to paycheck household, this attitude of poor people being greedy, irresponsible and stupid is reflected today, I think, in how we talk about food stamps, government subsidizing of housing and daycare and quote unquote luxury items. Um, unsurprisingly, Scoville's official slash unofficial responses weren't great either and often uh, uh, were, were uh, uh, anchored on anti-immigrant sentiment. So uh, this short article is in the May 1920 Scoville Bulletin and it frames most workers as allowing themselves to be organized into a mob by a lot of foreign born, hair tearing, hell raising anarchists. They should do an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. It's not signed, but it was printed into the official bulletin. So at some point it was approved or iterated by the, the Skogo uh, factory workers. Additionally, in the May 1920 bulletin, there are these three little uh, tidbits of articles. Uh, there's first one there framed is the announcement by Goss that Skogo will remain open for loyal and courageous employees insinuating that the employees who went out on strike don't care about the company, they're not loyal, they're cowardly fiends. <laughs> um, the tips, there's also on the far left, there's tips for being financially responsible. Uh, wow, I bet none of the strikers thought to increase their earnings or decrease their unnecessary spending. And interestingly, there's also a short article about Americanization of immigrants. Scoville managers found that immigrants who were taking English classes sponsored by the company were far less likely to participate in the strike. And this is something that the company continued well through the 40s. In addition to these articles, Scoville kept a great number of um, 
uh, graphs and tallies about various nationalities and the strike between uh, April and May and then between May and June. Um, so while the strikers often get painted as Bolsheviks, commies, or they're the ones that are stirring up all the trouble, almost all of the French Canadians and Portuguese went on strike. So, but that never gets addressed, of course. Uh, it's so interesting to me that the strikers' demands get boiled down to wages. That's not all that they were asking for. And yet Scoville doesn't mount a response to anything else. Strikers are framed as un-American, crazy, irresponsible, lazy, and it's always as someone who's just making trouble. This characterization is one of fear mongering towards white supremacist fear of white power losing, of white people losing power in America. Um, the status of the Brass Workers History Project is in progress. I was really hoping to be able to show you all some kind of fancy Omeka website with transcripts and oral histories, but I've subjected you mostly to ugly newspaper clippings that are copies of copies. Um, I'm the first trained archivist that the Meditech has had. So currently what we have available is a rough container list and some uh, digitized oral histories. Um, I hope, I am hoping to get them online through the CTDA, but the Brass History Workers Project initially was started as this curatorial project and was used for our history gallery permanent exhibit space. And like so many other projects, uh, the informational structure was lacking. And so uh, as I started digging through various boxes, I was having trouble finding control files and determining how many boxes were in a collection and where certain things were. Um, but I was able to gather some sort of intellectual control over the collection. Um, and so one of the things that I've been working on the most is digitizing oral history tapes. And um, uh, I would like us to listen to a brief clip from uh, John Hollingworth. Hollingworth was interviewed by Jeremy Brecker in 1980. Hollingworth was born in England and he was trained as a tool maker in the factories when he came to Waterbury to make a better life for himself. And Hollingworth volunteered for the CT State Guard and went on duty during both of the strikes. The um... Do you remember the big strikes after World War I? No, they had Very much. I was in the state, after the First World War, yeah. yeah. I was in the uh, State Guard at the time. Uh-huh. And I was on duty, and when the Lithuanian and the Polish were going to have a big do downtown, we formed a military square with a load of rifles. And we were told to shoot for the gut if you, if you come for us. Mm -hmm. That's how close we got. So we're glad we didn't have to pull the trigger. But I was, I, was, uh, I wanted a sharpshooter medal for uh, target practice. And I was pretty good on it too. Mm -hmm. But uh, as soon as we, uh, we got the order to uh, aim, they, they pulled away, broke the strike up. What year was that? Is that 1919? Let me see, 15. About 19. I, I can't tell you the mm -hmm. date. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. I was in on that all the way. Uh -huh. yeah. Where did that happen? What neighborhood? Hmm? What neighborhood did that happen in? Right in the center of Waterbury. Mm -hmm. On the green? Mm. They were going to break up the store window and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the sergeants of Waterbury shot in the neck of Scovers, too. Yeah. You remember, you, you read about that? Yeah. yeah. Bergen? No, it wasn't uh, Bergen. I can't remember his name, but the bullet, he had a scar on his neck after, over after that. Mm -hmm. But it was pretty close. The I'm going to save time for some questions because, of course, I'm running too late. Oh, nope. Sorry. Um, so the uh, the death of Liberto Tizzo. Um, Sorry. Uh, so uh, on June uh, 21st, Liberto Tizzo was shot by John Bergen and Lieutenant Leroy, and he later died in the hospital um, in uh, Waterbury. And the strike after this was never the same. Uh, they, uh, the strikers lost uh, confidence and they lost public uh, opinion. 
So newspaper clippings in the Scoville Bulletin celebrate the bravery of the police and wax on about what a difficult situation this was. And of course, I support the police and I don't think that they should have been uh, hit or shot. But um, where's the similar sympathy for uh, Chizo? He was labeled as an anarchist who was just a troublemaker and he deserved what he got. And um, that's problematic for me, I think, for many reasons. Um, so uh, one of the most interesting oral histories from the Brass History Workers Project is that of James Tizo. He was the brother of Liberto Tizo, and he was also at the strike that day. And he uh, uh, didn't necessarily witness what happened to his brother, but he went to the hospital with his brother and listened to his brother's deathbed confessional. And he's telling Jeremy Brecker, who interviewed him in 1981, about the strikes and about what happened to his brother. Um, it's a bit difficult to understand what he's saying, so I wrote out uh, uh, some things for you to be able to follow um, just in case. But it's a very powerful testimony nonetheless. With the soccer, because you belong to the, you credit the union, they belong to the union, the carpenter work, he belonged to the major. I said, make one, God, one. That's the one they got to be on the road, one. Not going to be so many. Well, we make a pretty good strong union. See. Then, you know, the union will make a strong, it was Italian fellow, was from, uh, uh, what, uh, Mother, Thomaston. It was a good talker. Who was his name? The Thomaston. Uh, the name is Kalman. The And uh, we had a meeting and I saw the man, bigger hall. I saw about 30,000 people. Close the door. Nobody want to know our business. Now he talk, everything, everything, give a power to say, okay. It was over at all. We don't know that guy. It was a sucker. Finish the meeting, close the door, you all go home, you go home, I go home. Tomorrow morning, what you say, we got to be on the line. And he claimed that son of a bitch, he go to the police station at that time, he closed the hall. You got to report to the, what you're going to be happen tomorrow, the police. They will come in and you are. You go kill your people. No, he went and he told the chief, the policeman, said, tomorrow morning, said, we're going to be biggest strike. We're going to shut up a scoble. I sent the so many troops, so many people, on this side of so many people, Baltimore Street. Over 10,000 on Baltimore Street to 10,000 for Eastern Man. We march. We walk for our own business. We do nothing out of it. Near the scoble, we find a seven policemen. Stay back. Who are you? We know about you. We walk of our own business. We just show it the shop how many people are the goddamn work. One of some of the bitches the copper, he go to the front on the front of the line, you know, all the younger fellow, eighteen, nineteen years old, and appreciate get the hell out of there about fucking William Bassey, what do you think you are? The police, you know, he wanted to put a hand on the boy. The boy, you know, ought to, like a dog. Some other cop in the kitchen, you know, the other cop, they said, ah, fine, well, fuck you. He said, a little bit alone. He said, what the hell are the people about you? And the line, you know, go. <clears throat> when you go, go in the corner, you know, the new road, you go in there. The other gang that come in from uh, Baltimore Street. Baltimore Street, right from the uh, San Maria Hospital. The same thing happened. Then they all the police, you know, and the guy that was a bigger chief of the police that was on the, uh, the lorry. He was on top of the horse. And the gang walked. It was a rain. My brother had a braille on his head. This policeman, you know, on top of the horse, they pushed the horse, you know, like that. The speed of the boy near the, the bridge. The boy said, well, what's the matter? He says, 
Stay back, you goddamn goody bastards. Uh, you know, before he uses a stick. Mm-hmm. But that guy don't want to see, he swings the goddamn stick. He swings the brow on his goddamn body. When he swings the brow, you know, that guy take a person, boom, boom. He drop on the ground. Now, before he drop on the ground, he had the gun. He pulled the gun, he shoot to the left hand. Doom, doom. You know, when he got out, blood, you know, hey. And the cop, he get him. He get two shots. He get one shot over there. I don't know what happened to him. The cop on top of the horse, he take off. And he fall right front of the door of San Money Hospital. Everybody pick up to him, help to him, you know. They push him in the hospital, call the doctor, three, three, you know, the blood. My brother, that's what I, I don't know who's on there, see. That's why I was over there by myself. And uh, <clears throat> my brother fought on the street, on the side of the water. Somebody threw a brick, you know. He had another guy, another police, right over there. Boom. He fought across to my brother. My brother still, you know, had a pistol in his hands. So, uh, With a seven policemen. Sorry. Um, so uh, after Liberto's death, cops searched his person and found communist propaganda on him. And uh, James claims later in the oral history that cops planted that on his brother because his brother was illiterate. Uh, Liberto told James what happened to him before he died, and James relays this on, on the tape. And I think that it's pretty powerful. Obviously, of course, uh, memory work and memory 60 years plus can be problematic and um, inaccurate, but I think that it's um, it's good just to even have this this source to complicate and 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 um, provide context for other sources that don't necessarily speak about Roberto as a person. Uh, so if I'm trying to wrap this kind of uh, up into some sort of cohesive thing, like what can I learn from my practice, about my practice from this 1980s project that I am now experiencing in 2020. Um, you know, I'm not going to be revolutionary here, but like as archives collect contemporary protest movements, you have to be careful to protect the protesters. Um, I wouldn't have wanted to collect Tizo's oral history back in 1920 uh, because it might have endangered him. Um, you have to give protesters, strikers, et cetera, time to grieve and process and heal. And that's uh, certainly not radical or revolutionary, but it's something that's uh, struck me and stuck with me throughout this project. Um, I am also heartened that after 60 years after the strike, material was able to even be collected. I feel extremely guilty that I haven't reached out to local organizers of our Black Lives Matter protests back in May and June. Um, so I just, I need to remind myself that I can't do everything as a Lunar Ranger and that I will get to it in this coming year and that perhaps um, people just need some time for distance, but that they will still have memories and things to share potentially. Um, so I struggled with this part of the presentation. Um, I've written and rewritten it like so many times and this morning I added a bunch of things to this presentation that I'm sure that you've noticed about my own personal context and my own personal iterations of different uh, Scoville and uh, Strikers uh, uh, management and information. And um, I don't know, I just, it shouldn't be a surprise. I think that libraries uphold white supremacy. Twitter has been a buzz uh, today and yesterday about the librarian who was found out to be a proud boy member and I've just read a lot of great takes about how it shouldn't be such a surprise and you know in in the past I've had a few disturbing inter interviews and conversations with librarians and archivists and fellow library students that have demonstrated that they don't really understand racism or structural racism that upholds white supremacist values uh, to them libraries are like neutral places of learning and information is never political but white supremacy is a belief of the superiority of white people and institutional racism upholds this belief in white supremacy. Institutional racism is about these structural privileges that we as white people benefit from both as a collective and individual level. 
and you can participate it participate in it even if you're not actively trying to. So archival accessioning then is not exempt from white supremacist tendencies and how can we as archivists kind of challenge this? I started my position here by creating a survey of collections and partially that was to understand what level of processing and what level of, of stage of care the collections were even in, but I also targeted collections that were made by people of color and women. Um, and so or out of the 75 distinct archival collections here at the Matatech, there is just one archival collection created by uh, people of color. Minority experiences exist in other collections, but it's only in the African American oral history project that Black voices really shine. And uh, now I'm at a stage where I really need to analyze and identify collecting strategies. How can I make sure to include different voices and not simply participate in tokenism? Um, and by doing part of by doing that is that I'm creating and identifying a list of master institutions and uh, local groups that I would like to collaborate with that are based in Waterbury and doing really great, interesting uh, social justice work. And uh, lastly, I'm looking to add to our oral history collections to complement some of our other collections and contradict and create these very interesting narratives. Um, specifically, I'm interested right now in the in the future of trying to identify family members of Waterbury radium girls. Those were uh, women that were poisoned by radium paint in several of the clock factories in Waterbury, and they uh, died horrible deaths mostly. Um, and the companies denied that they poisoned them for a very long time. Um, so that's one aspect that I'm currently thinking of. And in terms of oral histories, I wanted to end it by, I'm sure probably most of you don't need this, but I work at a small institution in a small archive. So I wanted to kind of put out there that I'm available for people to ask questions with uh, in terms of oral histories and small archives. And so my tips in general, practical initial problems in terms of like space and control files, how will other people know who you interviewed and what format are those interviews in? How will you be able to share them online? Can you dedicate time to transcripts? Uh, what stories are being told in your archive? Who can you reach out to? What's in danger of being lost? If you have thousands of cassette tapes like I do, uh, you can use Audacity to digitize them, and I have a workflow that I'm willing to share if anyone's interested, and uh, look for archival collectives and consortiums in your state and region to help with digital repositories and archive space. I've done that in order to save money, and uh, have a real conversation with your institution about obsolescence and how much money they're willing to put in and contribute to the collection in the future. You can't just digitize it and forget about it. So, um, that's my presentation. Thank you so much. And hopefully there's five minutes worth of time for questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Stephanie. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I do want to open it up for questions. We really only have about one minute, but I was wondering, would you mind putting your email in the chat and would you be able to take some questions via mm -hmm. email just in case yes. we, we don't have the time to get through anything? or get through many. Um, I don't have any questions in the chat yet, except wait. Oh, sorry, okay. I put it for, sorry. Okay, you got your email. I was wondering what, what's the current labor environment in that area and does this history inform the, in the present day? Yeah, so we're a pretty post-industrial kind of town. Most of the big, most of the big three best brass factories have been uh, bought by larger conglomerations and turned into something else. Um, they're extraordinarily small if they're even still in Waterbury. Most of them don't have any kind of uh, instance in Waterbury. Scoville factory actually was turned into our mall. So that's fun. Um, but uh, there are still some kind of uh, small factories in the area, but nothing, uh, nothing sustainable like what it was before. So I think we're, we're kind of struggling with this history of the fact that like we used to be this big booming town and uh, people would come here to have a better life and to be able to raise their children. And now it's uh, very difficult to find 
a job that's uh, sustainable for a kind of livable wage. we are at then session six and I'll be ending this one. I'm hoping to, the link to session six is posted in the chat and I hope